Well, uh, welcome to our evening service here at the Salford Community Church and a warm welcome uh, to those who will be uh, listening online as well. Uh, we're going to begin by opening in prayer and then we'll have the music to a hymn and the words will be seen on the screen. Let's, uh, let's bow our heads in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we uh, thank you again that we're able to gather uh, in this way, whether it be in the church building itself or online. We thank you, Lord, for the gathering of your people. We remind ourselves that when your people gather, there, uh, dear Jesus, you promised you would be in the midst. And we pray, Father, uh, for uh, that sense of your presence with us, uh, God, the Holy Spirit, moving amongst us. And that, Lord, we might be uh, encouraged and strengthened uh, as we seek to worship you. And as we uh, come to your word, we pray indeed that God, the Holy Spirit, will take of your word and use it uh, to be a, a real um, strengthener uh, to us, a real blessing to us, and encourager for the week ahead. So guard us and guide us, because, Lord, we desire that you have the honor and you have the glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we're back in the letter of Paul to the Philippians, and chapter 1, and we're starting at verse 27, at the end of the chapter, and we're going to be moving into chapter 2 and verse 11. Last uh, Sunday evening, we were looking at verse 27. Um, originally, I said that I was hoping to... Uh, give one sermon from verses 27 to verse 30. Uh, we're, on, we're not going very far tonight. We're only doing verse 28. Uh, we will eventually get out of uh, chapter 1, I'm sure, uh, sometime uh, this side of Christmas. Uh, but it's Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27. And so let's share the word of God as we remind ourselves that Paul uh, was telling uh, the Christians at Philippi about his situation, which was in prison, and uh, the possibility that he might be executed or the possibility that he was going to be spared. But whatever way, he was content that God's will will be done. And so he says to the church in verse 27, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs. Do you stand fast? in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but uh, to you of salvation and that from God. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer uh, for his sake having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by, by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God, has, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every knee, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Well, may the Lord add his blessing to that reading from his precious word uh, this evening. Well, let's come to prayer. Let's pray. 
Father, on this uh, rather cold evening, we praise you and thank you uh, that we're able to give a witness and a testimony uh, to the surrounding uh, streets and area in uh, which this church is put. Thank you, Lord, that people, as they walk by, or people sit looking from their homes will see that the lights are on in the church and that the people who love the Lord Jesus Christ have gathered to worship. And we do pray especially, Lord, for your help in worshipping you. We're very conscious, Lord, of our own frailties and our own weaknesses, our own inadequacies. Uh, Lord, we want to worship you with a, a full and glad heart uh, we want to worship you so, such that the praise of your people will come to you as a sweet-smelling savour. But we're very, also very conscious, O oh Lord, that we need the help of the Holy Spirit to do that. We pray that he would be the perfecter of your people's prayers and your people's praise and worship this evening so that we can give you all the glory and all the honour. Uh, we pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit might indeed be uh, moving amongst us, uh, that he might be instructing our minds, but also speaking to our souls, our hearts, of very precious things, things that will encourage us, things that will do us good, and especially about our Lord Jesus Christ as well. Father, we praise you and thank you for the Holy Spirit who fills his church and did so at the day of Pentecost and continues to do so. We thank you, Lord, that he is the comforter, the paraclete that Jesus promised. And we praise you also as we remember that the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour, your Son, is seated at your right hand and is praying for us. So help us then, Lord. We pray especially in these uh, dark days in which we live, and they seem to be uh, difficult days for the Gospel and for your Church that the reality of yourself will be more prominent amongst us. We might know with a certainty that you are God and there is none other. That we might know uh, with a certainty that there's only one way uh, to heaven and it's through Jesus Christ, your son, who said that he was the way, the truth and the life and that no one could come to the Father except through him. Father, strengthen us in the days ahead, this week ahead especially. Lord, there may be many things that will come and test us and try us. There may be many things that will bring sorrow and sadness to us. But we pray, Lord, for your presence to be alongside us, to give us the comfort and to give us the strength and give us the ability, the enabling uh, to walk in the light of your word in the world in which we live. Lord, we think uh, these days of the much opposition that seems to be against your true church and against the gospel, and how so many people seem to uh, want to ignore you, uh, care nothing for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, consider the Bible perhaps as an ancient book that should be left on the shelf and that your people, perhaps, are strange people and not worth considering. But Lord, we pray that the reality that we know of you and of our Saviour Jesus may be a reality that you will once more reveal upon this world in which we live, so that even uh, the most ungodly will declare that God is here. And that's what we desire, Lord, that this uh, world in which we live, this uh, darkened world, uh, darkened in terms of a, of a faithlessness, might know something of the light of the gospel shining out. Uh, we pray that it might shine out from this place. This is your church. Uh, and we pray that it might shine in, in the area in which we serve, in uh, Salford and Canesham. We pray for other gospel churches also shining, shining forth a gospel light and that it might indeed penetrate into the souls, into the minds of men and women and boys and girls throughout our land. We might hear of people coming to faith in Jesus. 
becoming true believers in Christ. To that end, Lord, we also pray as a church, a fellowship here, that you would open doors for us, doors of effective ministry and service where we can proclaim Christ, where we can lift the Lord Jesus Christ high and where people can be drawn to the gospel and find for themselves Jesus, Saviour and Lord of their lives. And in this, Lord, we give you praise and ask your blessing upon our prayers. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we're going to be, to be looking at uh, Philippians chapter 1. Uh, and uh, I mentioned uh, we're going to be looking at really at verse 28, but we're still in that section, verse 27 to 30. And uh, the, the thought uh, tonight would be uh, turning the negatives into positives to give God pleasure. Uh, last Sunday evening, there were a number of positives. I'm going to look at those just very briefly in a moment. But as we move into verse 28 and again into 29 and 20 and verse 30 as well, we discover there's a lot of negatives that Paul is saying. But those negatives can be turned into positives that will give God pleasure. <clears throat> so uh, let's, let's start with our introduction. And we're we'll again continuing with the idea of the theme of how we are to live so God will delight in us. That was the theme that we started last Sunday evening. And in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27, we have this particular verse. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together in the faith of the gospel. And there were three things that we mentioned last Sunday evening. I think it's worth going through them very briefly to, to, so we, as we move into the next verse. But the, the three things were these. Uh, uh, do nothing to harm the gospel. Uh, be an example to other believers. And be united together with one another. So those are positives. Uh, whatever you do, don't do anything that was going to hinder or hurt the gospel's message proclamation. Be a godly example to other people and seek to be in the unity of the spirit uh, with one another. But even those positive things uh, that, that we can do, um, we discover that there often are bad things in the Christian life, or at least not bad things in us necessarily, but bad things that happen to us because of our faith in the Lord Jesus. And there are times when we need to take courage and we need to be bold and to realize that even when bad things seem to be happening, God can see them and delight in us because he sees our faithfulness in those bad times our faithfulness in Christ Jesus. So we're going to be looking at some of those negatives. Um, uh, just two, really, we're going to be mentioning uh, today. Uh, a ball from verse uh, 28 uh, itself. So the first is, do not be intimidated by the enemies of the gospel. And if we read verse 28, you'll see where uh, I'm coming from from there. There we read in verse 28, uh, and not, says Paul, in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition. Uh, we'll get to with that word perdition a little bit later on. It's one of those words you don't tend to use in your vocabulary from day to day, uh, but we'll get to that in a moment. But to you of salvation, and that from God. So what I want to emphasize here is that word that the New King James uh, translates as terrified. Not in any way terrified by your adversaries. And as we put that heading up, it was 
do not be intimidated by the enemies of the gospel. Now that word terrified in other translations uh, is trans uh, translated as frightened. Don't be frightened by the enemies of the gospel. Another translation has the word don't be intimidated. Uh, it's that word intimidated that I want to, to use for our heading. Uh, if I can go back and just remind you what the heading was. Do not be intimidated by the enemies of the gospel. Now, the reason why I chose intimidated is that if we were in another part of the world, perhaps uh, in some uh, Muslim country or uh, some other country which was not uh, in any way, shape or form anything like a, a, a Christian, then we might indeed be terrified and fearful. Fearful of being imprisoned, like Paul. Uh, terrified of our lives, like perhaps it was, was some of the Philippian uh, uh, Christians might well have been suffering. But in our Western culture, in our Western world, I think it's more a case of being intimidated. Intimidated by uh, powerful people, perhaps. Uh, and we, we must not be intimidated by the enemies of the gospel. But intimidation is real. Fear is real. Being terrified is real. Uh, I'm reminded of the disciples. You know, the disciples in between that time when the Lord Jesus Christ has been crucified on the cross and the day of Pentecost, uh, there was a real fear. Uh, they, they, they'd gone up into the upper room uh, they locked themselves in, and we're told in the scriptures that they uh, did so out of fear of the Jewish leaders, out of fear of the Jews, it says, of the Jewish leaders. And, and they were, uh, there was a real fear there. There was a prob probably a real terror there. Uh, will they come knocking on the door? Will they arrest the 12? Well, by that time, of course, they become 11. But will they arrest the 11? Uh, will they not only be thrown in prison, will, will they be crucified? And then you come on the day of Pentecost. And what happens? Well, God, the Holy Spirit, comes down upon them. They become different people. They are emboldened by God, the Holy Spirit, and, and they preach Christ and him crucified. So what's happened? Well, it's simply this. They have been made different by God, the Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit, has given them that boldness and that courage. Now, I want to uh, draw some lessons from this at this point. And the first one is, it is not sinful to be frightened. Because sometimes, you know, if you're um, frightened, terrified, or intimidated uh, by people, uh, you, you, can, you, you can feel pretty hard on yourself. You can be pretty hard on yourself. It's all my fault. I'm a very poor, weak little Christian that I should be so frightened, should be so terrified, so intimidated by, by the things of the world. But the world is against the church. The world is against Jesus. The world is against believers. The world hates us, as Jesus said uh, it would. And our own human nature, which is a fallen human nature, can be terrified and frightened of all kinds of things. Like spiders. How many of you are frightened with spiders? Well, they're only a small thing. They've got eight legs, and that makes them a bit different. But it's only a small thing. But there's nothing wrong in being frightened. There's nothing wrong in being terrified of a spider that's crawling along on, on your bedroom floor. And perhaps we, we've all had experiences of, uh, of, of being frightened, uh, perhaps even terrified, certainly intimidated, uh, when we've gone perhaps for a, a job interview. Or uh, in some cases, and this happened to me a few times, uh, going to see the headmaster at school because you've done something wrong. Now that can be really frightening, can't it? Um, and you go along, don't you? And you're not feeling very confident. You think you're going to have a bit of a problem. You're feeling weak. You're feeling vulnerable. You're feeling the pressure that's on you. And, and then, uh, this is what happens to me sometimes, you come out and say something really stupid. 
the most intimidating moment of my life was not a job interview, and it was not even going to see the headmaster. It was going to have an interview in a Bible college. Now, you might think that's very strange. But this Bible college was something different. When I got to this Bible college in London, this is where I trained to be a pastor, in front of me, when I walked in through the door and into the room, there were seven pastors. I don't know why there were seven. Maybe it was the perfect number. But there were seven pastors. And the church I was going to at that time, these seven pastors, every single one of them had been one of the guest preachers at the church. And uh, being a, a young fellow, uh, and uh, I was just in awe of these men. These were the men. And uh, they were there sitting there. And I was so intimidated. I was so, I only expected to have an interview with one person, which was, I thought was going to be the principal. But no, there was these seven reverend gentlemen, all looking with their suits on and their ties, all looking very somber. I, I should have realized they really were on my side and they really would like to have me come to their Bible college. But I really thought the opposite, that they desperate, they were going to have me at their Bible college and they wouldn't want someone like me. And the very first question they asked was this. What, have, what, what Christian books have you been reading lately? And you know what happened to me? Mine went blank. I couldn't remember a single book that I've ever, Christian book, I had ever read for about two or three minutes. And one of the reverend gentlemen uh, said to me, um, I'm sure you must have read something, he said. <laughs> and, and, and that sort of broke the ice a bit, and I was able to, to answer the question properly, and, and I sort of got over it. That was the most intimidating time I had, I've ever had in my life. You know, I, I can face job interviews, I can face headmasters, but that was frightening for me. I think sometimes it's even worse when the opponents of Christ, when the enemies of the gospel, become the intimidators. I can remember an experience when I was um, a student at university and uh, people uh, knew I was a, a Christian and the, the man who was my supervisor for my PhD uh, knew I was a Christian. But I can remember uh, sort of trying to witness to him and, and he said this and he said, and I thought that you had more intelligence than that. And that just shut me up. <laughs> it was the intimidation, you know. Uh, so there's nothing wrong. Uh, it's not sinful to be frightened or terrified or intimidated. That's part of our fallen human nature. So don't beat yourself up about that. But there's another lesson that we can learn, and it's this. Remember that your Father in heaven is the Almighty Father. You know, some of these people who might be intimidating us might be very powerful people, but God is more powerful. He is the Almighty God. So people might have power on earth, but it's God who gives the power. Well, we can think of Jesus, for example, in the Garden of Gethsemane. At that moment when he's being arrested and the big crowd have gathered and they've got their torches and they've got their clubs, as we're told in, in the Gospels, and uh, the disciples are panicking, and Jesus says to, to them, uh, do you not know that I can call upon 12 legions of angels? You know, he could be rescued if he wanted to be. Think of all those hundreds of angels that could come, could come to his aid. He had that power, didn't he? Oh, there in John chapter 19 and verse 11, this is where Jesus has been speaking to Pilate. And Jesus tells Pilate. But Pilate thinks he's got the power over life and death with Jesus, but in actual fact, Jesus tells him otherwise. You could have no power at all against me unless it has been given you from above, says, says Jesus. Well, a third lesson we can learn from that first point is this. Call upon the Holy Spirit for help. So instead of being fearful or terrified or intimidated, 
and, uh, and, get, and beating yourself up about this, when you're feeling like that, which is a, a human natural reaction, call upon God the Holy Spirit to help you. God the Holy Spirit uh, emboldened and equipped the, uh, the apostles uh, and the people up in the upper room to go out and preach the gospel, despite their Jewish leaders and despite what people might have said. I've got a bigger title than I put on this third lesson, which was call upon the Holy Spirit to keep you from fear and terror and to stop you from being intimidated by the world and by the devil. Because the devil loves to intimidate. The world wants to make us fearful and terrified. But you call upon God the Holy Spirit. Now, how do you, what do you do? What do you say to God the Holy Spirit? I think you just tell him. Tell God, the Holy Spirit, how fearful you are, how intimidated you are, how terrified you are, perhaps, how overwhelmed you might be. Uh, tell him that you are uh, fearful, that you might not be able to stand in, in a day of trouble, that you might bring shame uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ, that you might wound the bride of Christ, which is the church, that you might become an unfaithful servant of Jesus. Well, those are real fears. That's a real fear for, for, for a believer, isn't it? A sensitive, uh, gospel-loving, Jesus-loving uh, believer. Our, our fear would be to, that we would let the Lord Jesus Christ down, that we would bring shame uh, to Christ, that we would hurt the church, that we would bring the gospel in some dis uh, disgrace because of us. But those are real fears. I guess we all have them from time to time. We might think, well, they're rational. But they're real fears nonetheless. So do you have a fear that you will be exposed, uh, that you are uh, such an unworthy servant for Jesus? I think we all have our moments like that, don't we? You know, uh, it usually happens to me on a Monday morning that I'm such an unworthy servant. Why did I? Why did I preach those sermons yesterday? I really messed up or something like that. But I think often the Lord uses such fears and such terrors to bring us to our knees. You know, what God doesn't want is a pile of proud Christians. What he wants is a vast number of humble believers in Jesus, doesn't he? And when we're terrified and when we're fearful, perhaps we need to do something. Perhaps we need to ask God that we, we know what we, God would have us to do, perhaps, and say to God, I, I will not go unless you go with me. And the reason why I mentioned that is I want to tell you a story about a Welsh preacher. Uh, by now you've probably heard his name because I've mentioned him a couple of times. Uh, and that's Hal Harris. Hal Harris uh, was a, uh, an evangelist. I think that's probably the best term that you could use for him uh, in the 1730s. Uh, he had a reputation of being a very fearless preacher. He was bold. He was courageous. Uh, you know, he was one of those people you think, well, th there's this hostile... Well, in fact, that's, there are quite a few occasions when he was, he was in front of a hostile crowd who were threatening to kill him. One man even tried to shoot him, and the gun didn't go off. But you know, he was such bold, he had a reputation for being fearless, bold, and courageous. But if you read his life story, you discover that that really wasn't him. In fact, we read that constantly, before he climbed up the pulpit steps to preach the gospel, his prayer was this. And he was praying to the Holy Spirit, really. I cannot go unless you come with me. There's a famous story. I'm not going to tell you about that. You, you, you can ask me on another occasion. But it's a famous story about how uh, he was 45 minutes late <laughs> going up into the pulpit because he was in the vestry pleading for God the Holy Spirit to be with him to go up into the pulpit. So I told you about the story. Now I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, do you feel anxious these days? I mean, a lot of people are anxious, aren't they? 
they hear the news. In fact, a lot of people I've been noticing were saying, I don't bother listening to the news anymore. I don't want to listen to the news. Or, or limit the amount of news to the headlines and then switch it off. And we can feel anxious about all the things that are happening. Well, I feel anxious too. And I, I confess before you that last week, I don't know why particularly, but I was feeling quite anxious about all kinds of things, and they were really small little trivial things uh, that were making me feel really low. Now, when that happened, I went to Philippians, in chapter 4, and uh, verse 5 and verse 6. It's a great text if you're feeling anxious. Verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. There we are, God's word. Be anxious for nothing. Uh, but in everything, well, it's saying, give it to, to the Lord. Give your anxiety, give, you, give the problems that are concerning you, the worries, give it to the Lord. And I think that... Uh, Last bit there, with thanksgiving, that's, a, that's an important point, I think. Uh, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. But, that wasn't the verse that, that, that was the balm to my soul. It was the one before that. Verse 5. Let your gentleness be known to all men. Now, that wasn't the bit that was the balm to my soul. It was those four words. The, the, was it? Uh, the Lord is at hand. And uh, actually, it's three words in Greek. And uh, probably a, a better translation, I think, would be this. The Lord is near. And I needed that. Anxious about all things, I needed to know the Lord is, is near. The Lord's long, alongside. <laughs> Because sometimes we think we're carrying it all by ourselves, don't we? Uh, God is up there somewhere. And, uh, you know, he's not going to be bothered about my little problems and my little anxieties, but he is. And the Bible tells us the Lord is near. And it's been a great comfort to me. Well, let's move on to the second point uh, this evening. Uh, and that is standing firm in Christ is a testimony of the reality of Jesus in you. Let's go uh, to verse 28 again. So we'll throw that up. No. If I go back, I'll, I'll quote it. Actually, I'm going to quote it uh, in a slightly different translation. Because if you, if you look at verse 28 uh, in the New King James Version, I, I, I don't know about you, but I find I have difficulty with the English in that verse. And let me read the New King James, and then I'll read a slightly different translation. Uh, and there Paul says, And not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation, and that from God. And I read it, and I think, well, I, I, I think I know what he's talking about. But let me give you a, a, another translation, and I think it's a slightly clearer translation. It's verse 28. By not being intimidated in any way by your opponents, this is a sign of their destruction. So that's what the word petition means, destruction. But of your salvation, which is from God. What this word, this text is telling us is that if we stand firm in Christ, it will be a testimony to the reality of Jesus in you. It will be a testimony to the fact that the world and others, brothers and sisters in Christ, will see that Jesus is in you, that Jesus is real in you. And that's an important testimony. That's an important thing. But it also will... Uh, speak against the opposers of the gospel. Because as it shows the reality of Jesus in you, 
it will show the reality of their end without Christ, without Jesus. When you, and you can only stand against the terrors and the intimidations directed at you by those who oppose the gospel, when you're standing on Christ, you're standing in Christ's power, on Christ our solid rock. There's a hymn that goes like that, isn't it? On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. If you're standing on that solid ground of Christ, you can stand against the terrors and the, the fears and the intimidations that are, that are being hurled towards you. And as you stand, it's a testimony against those people who are, and the devil who are sending those terrors and those fears and those intimidations towards you. Our standing is a testimony of the reality of our faith and love in Jesus. And we can only do it, as we mentioned before, through the Holy Spirit, trusting in Jesus. One picture uh, that is often portrayed in the scriptures in the New Testament about um, the trials and the troubles uh, and the difficulties of believers is that of the furnace. You know, believers in Jesus are gold. And the image is that of uh, gold which has been contaminated with with dross, impurities. And you put, a, you put gold into a furnace, you heat up the, the furnace, and, and the, the dross, the impurities, are, are, are burnt away. That's what troubles and trials and difficulties uh, do uh, for the Christian. Our, 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 our dross, uh, the sins uh, that so easily cling to us, are burnt away, are dealt with by our trials and troubles and and uh, uh, difficulties. Those who uh, seek to oppose the cause of Christ are, are walking on dangerous ground. They don't realize it, but they really are, aren't they? Because when they are intimidating you, when they're bringing terrors and fears to you, they're opposing Christ. They're opposing God the Father, they're imposing the gospel. Now, by God's grace, uh, they may, it may happen, like it happened to the Apostle Paul, who was a great intimidator and terrifier of God's people, that God will deal with that, those people, deal with that person, so that they see for themselves the reality of who Jesus is. They will see the Savior and come to faith. But if they don't, their opposition against God's people and God's church be adding to their condemnation. So what happens? What, what should we do, rather? What should we do? What should we do for those who are opposers to God's truth? What should we do for those who are intimidating us? Or, terif or trying to terrify us, or trying to make us fearful, or bringing us trouble and, and difficulty because we are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. What should we do for them? We should pray for them. So let me bring that scripture to you. It's Matthew chapter 5. It's part of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 and verse 44. Let me read it. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. I, I guess Jesus is quoting uh, the Jewish leaders on that point. Uh, the Jewish leaders really uh, had a number of enemies, you know, Samaritans and Gentiles, and they, that's probably what they were teaching in the synagogue, you know, love your neighbor, because that was in the Old Testament, but hate your enemy. Well, Jesus says, you shouldn't do that, really. He says in verse 44, But I say to you, love your enemies and bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. 
So what does Jesus say about those who are opposed to the gospel, those who are in, intimidating us, those who are terrifying us, those who are fearful, fear, uh, bringing fear to us, those who are trying to hurt the gospel? Jesus says, pray for them. Now that's pretty radical, isn't it, uh, really? Well, let me give you an illustration of that. Um, I think I'm going to say this. I'm going to put my neck out here and say most people have heard of a man called Eric Little. I'm not sure the young... The, you have? Good. Well done. I'm glad about that. Because otherwise it, make it, it, makes it, it makes the illustration really bad of what... Eric Little, uh, there was a famous film about, it, about him, wasn't there? He was part of that film. It's called Chariots of Fire. Uh, I remember going to see it, and I thought it was quite a, quite a good Christian... Well, it wasn't supposed to be a Christian film, but it was a good Christian film uh, for, for the secular world, I thought. And one of the heroes in that film, of course, was this man, Eric Little. He was a Christian, and he was standing upon uh, scriptural, biblical principles. And we, see, we saw that in the film as well. Uh, and he was an athlete. Uh, he ran in the Olympics, I think it was 1924. But perhaps what the film didn't really make, uh, make much of was the fact that after he uh, had ran in the Olympics, he went off to be a missionary in China. And uh, when he was a missionary in China, uh, the Second World War happened. He was uh, captured uh, as a prisoner of war by the Japanese who came and invaded that part of China. And he was sent to a notorious prison camp. And there in that notorious prison camp, uh, who, uh, uh, well, I've, I've seen the name of it, but I can't pronounce it. Uh, in that notorious prison camp in China, he became sort of the sort of kind of unofficial pastor, unofficial chaplain to the prisoners. And uh, there was another Christian man there uh, who, uh, who wrote a, a book about what happened uh, to Eric Little uh, while he was in the prison camp. He wrote a sort of biography of Eric Little when he, came, when he was released. And... Uh, he said that Eric Little, while he was there, as the pastor, uh, spent many, many months preaching to the people, pre people uh, to the prisoners, from the Sermon on the Mount. And I've just messed up my notes there, so I'm just turning around to the right notes. Um, and he said that as he was going through the Sermon on the Mount, he was convicted by the verses that we just read. The verse about loving your enemies and praying for your enemies. Uh, Jesus, Matthew 5, verse 44, But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Now, you can see the relevance, I think, there uh, to what, uh, what's happening to Eric Little. Well, he's in that terrible prisoner of war camp. And he started saying and preaching to the, to the prisoners that they ought to love their uh, prison guards and they should pray for their prison guards. Well, the majority of prisoners laughed. Well, you can imagine that, can't you? The majority of people would say, you must be out of your mind. How can you, how can you love people like that? who are treating us so badly. But Eric Little persisted, we're told. And then others joined him in his uh, time of prayer uh, for the, the soldiers. And uh, they, they sought to love their enemies. And we're told that slowly, but very gradually, a change came over the camp. And the soldiers could see and feel the love of some of the prisoners for them. Eric Little died in that prison because of the conditions and the, uh, of the prison camp. But there in that camp, even amongst people, uh, prisoners who didn't love Jesus, didn't know Jesus, he had left a witness for Christ in the hearts of those prisoners who had heard him preach, love your enemy, 
pray for your enemy. And some of the soldiers also testify uh, about Eric Little, that here was a man who made an impact upon their lives because of the way that he prayed for them and he loved them. The man who wrote this biography uh, is called For the Glory. I've not been able to find a copy, but uh, it says, he said that uh, Little uh, told his congregation, that's the way the guy described it, and also his Sunday school classes, this is the, the, the congregation in the prison camp and the Sunday, Sunday school classes he was running as well. He said to them, I begun to pray for the guards and it's changed my whole attitude towards them. When we hate them, we are self-centered. And I think we could add probably that when we pray, when he prayed for them, he went from being self-centered to being Christ-centered. He was simply doing what the Lord Jesus Christ told his disciples to do. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That's a positive, isn't it? The negative, the opposers of the gospel who are trying to intimidate us and be, make us fearful and terrify us. But the positive is to pray for them, to love them. Praying for those prison guards in that uh, prisoner of war camp and seeking to love his enemies made Eric Little very much like his saviour. Well, may that be true of us. May it be that when these problems and difficulties come, and when we think perhaps that the people who are laughing at us and trying to intimidate us and mocking our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and trying to make us look so small in the eyes of the world, well, maybe we need to be like Eric Little, or more, more importantly, more like Jesus. We should love those who are opposed to the gospel, and we should pray for them. Let's bow our heads in prayer now. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and uh, realize, Lord, that uh, uh, this evening, as we were thinking about people who oppose the gospel and people, Lord, who don't think much of the Christian faith and perhaps have no real consideration about yourself, Lord, we, we do pray for them because really, Lord, they're on dangerous ground, eternally dangerous ground. And we're fearful for their souls. And Lord, we would pray that you, you would do a work in their souls. A work, Lord, that might expose the sin in their lives. A work, perhaps, which might terrify them to realize what they have done against the Almighty God. But like what you did with Saul of Tarsus on that road to Damascus, when you open their eyes to see Jesus and that they may believe in Jesus. And Lord, for ourselves, this world, Lord, is uh, a difficult place for, to be a Christian, to be a, a, a servant of Jesus. And so we would ask and pray for your help. Help us, Lord, to be like Howell Harris, I suppose, and be bold and courageous and almost fearless in wanting to share the gospel with others. Lord, help us when there are those times when we are fearful and terrified and intimidated by the things of the world and by the devil himself. But help us to remember that you're the almighty God and that you're at hand. And we shouldn't be anxious about anything, but to give all that anxiety to you. And so as we enter into a new week, Lord, will we 
We pray that you will enable us to enter it with a, um, a confidence and a boldness as we seek to be faithful servants of our Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.